Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It's Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntra is here. I am happy to welcome back, live for the first time, Jerry Conway to Word Balloon. Good to see you, Jerry. Hi, hey, John. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Uh, I, uh, it looks like everything's going okay. How are you handling things uh, COVID-wise? Well, uh, it, it's it's stressful, you know, obviously. Uh, we're not uh, happy about uh uh, where things are, but uh, so far, knock on wood, we've been fortunate. Uh, we have had a couple of people in our uh, extended friends group who've been affected, but uh, fortunately, nobody in our immediate family. Uh, so, you know, we're getting by like everyone else. No, I understand, man. Well, geez, Jerry, they're already uh, commenting. This is nice. Look at that. John V., uh... Pays you the best compliment. Absolutely, man. And I'm I'm with you, John V, 100%. I was telling Jerry just before we got started, uh, as a nine-year-old kid, I read The uh, Death of Gwen Stacy, and it blew my mind in the most, like, intriguing and positive ways because it really showed that there can really be consequences in a story and everything doesn't have a happy ending. And, uh, wow, you know, again, we'll, we'll likely get into it. I'm sure people may want to talk a bit about that storyline. Uh, and yeah, there you go. Junk Banks also agrees that, uh, you know, you're a legend and I <laughs> can't say it enough. <laughs> Jerry's going to join us for Baltimore Comic Con online the weekend of uh, October uh, 23rd through the 25th. And I can tell everybody right now, and I was just telling Jerry one of my ideas and uh, the other participants already on board, Brian Bendis, a nice conversation between Jerry and Brian Bendis talking about Got all those uh, all the characters you guys uh, both wrote for, and uh, I, your DC and Marvel experiences. I think that's going to be a hell of a conversation. Should be fun. I'm Excellent. Looking forward yeah. to it. You know, I have the provocative uh, title card up there about uh, what do we do about the Punisher in uh, uh -huh. in today's environment? And certainly, I'm sure you've seen the articles as well. And in fact, you uh, you even I think maybe reacted to some of uh, what was going on. And I'm going to bring up the visual that you were talking about kind of reclaiming the Punisher's logo from, from the police and army forces that kind of are a little too much with me. I'm going to pop that up there right now. There it is. Yeah. So there's three yeah. examples of, yeah. How's that going? Uh, well, we did that in June. That was a uh, fundraiser that we did for, uh, that my, my wife, Laura, uh, actually managed uh, for uh, Black Lives Matters Los Angeles. Uh, and we raised uh, over $70,000 by selling these t-shirts. Uh, and we gave uh, an audience to a number of young artists of color who each, you know, the only uh, uh, requirement of the uh, assignment was to create a design that uh, claimed the Punisher's logo for Black Lives Matter. Uh, and, uh, it, uh, it had an impact, you know, I think we, we, we sold over 5,000 shirts. So some of them, I guess, will be showing up at a protest near you. Uh, and, uh, it was at least a little, you know, a, an attempt to push back on the notion, uh, that the Punisher represents some kind of, uh, uh, authority within, uh, you know, the, the police or military which he really doesn't. He's a, he's a sign of uh, social dysfunction and is intended 
as a criticism of uh, society in general from the point of view of an outsider who hasn't received justice from society, from the uh, organs of society that are represented by the police and uh, the military. Um, so, you know, I, I totally get why there are uh, some people, uh, progressives on, on, on the left with me, you know, because I'm, I'm a leftist progressive, uh, who uh, perceive the Punisher uh, as uh, irredeemable. Uh, but I, I think that's a misreading of the character, uh, as bad a misreading of the character as uh, the police who've tried to embrace it uh, as a representative of their own. Understood. You know, going back to its beginnings, um, I know too, and I, and I don't even know the answer and don't remember the answer. I'm sure we've covered this before. But Don Pendleton's character, the executioner, mm -hmm. was a men's adventure paperback uh, cre yeah, you know, was, creation. Yeah. And was that was that first? Oh, that was yeah. That that preceded uh, the Punisher. Uh, it was certainly an influence on creating the character. But you know, we were also uh, the Punisher was created at a time uh, when uh, uh, social services in New York, police uh, services in New York, were failing, uh, and the city was uh, in pretty crappy shape. You know, and there was a there was a, a a real uh, upsurge in crime, uh, you know, clearly poverty driven and, uh, uh, you know, a result of uh, real dysfunction, you know, in the, in, in, uh, the social uh, structure. Uh, and that was, I think, the, the primary motivator. I mean, as a kid and as a young adult living in New York, you know, I was certainly aware of it. I was aware of the uh, the uh, the executioner as well but you know and i don't think that was a primary motivator okay okay you got started writing very young and i know mm -hmm. i in fact i uh, saw i think it was a piece of that uh, superheroes documentary that pbs made a couple of years right. ago yeah and you were talking about how i think getting into uh the minds of the dc people you were you were doing the tours that they sure. used to do the junior the junior woodchucks right or wasn't that the name of the uh, <laughs> well the they, group? I, woodchucks came a little bit uh, a little bit after me but uh, yeah we were the, um, uh, the the particular fans that that uh, were doing that were uh, uh, Marvel and Len Wein uh, would come every week I I went on a tour um, in the early uh, early 19th summer of 1967 i guess it was uh and discovered you know met marv and len and re and discovered that they were going every week so i decided that would be good uh, <laughs> i had nothing nothing much to do that summer uh and what they would do when um when the tour started they would slip off and go hang out and talk to the different editors and try to sell them on uh, story ideas or scripts or art, uh, depending on what, what they were up to. Uh, Steve Mitchell, uh, an anchor, uh, was also part of that, uh, that crowd. Um, and me, you know, and I was, I was the kid in the group. I was like uh, probably 15 years old when I started doing this. Uh, That's great. Maybe, maybe just turned 15. I'm trying to, the summer of 67, I would have been 14 uh and turned 15 in september and then the next year was the year that i actually sold something wow. um and sold that just before i turned 16. but it took me a full year of, of going in um hanging out meeting with editors uh meeting uh dick giordano when he became an editor um and subsequently making a real pest of myself <laughs> and become kind of ubiquitous, you know, in the office. What was that uh, first sale? Uh, it actually wasn't to Dick. It was to um, Murray Boltonoff, who shared an wow. office with. Yeah, he shared an office with <laughs> Dick and with um, uh, Joe Orlando. They they had this not very big office space that they they all shared. And he had Murray had seen me coming in, and sitting with at dick and talking with dick for like weeks and weeks and weeks and murray was under pressure to 
uh, bring in new new talent, you know, to work with new talent, new creators. So wow. he assumed that I was a new creator that was working with Dick. Uh, and so, you know, I I pitched him, you know, he, I, either he asked me or I, I asked him, you know, if he if he was open to stories and uh, he said, yes, you know, and I, I, we, we worked on a story, a three page story for something like six or eight weeks with uh, every week I would bring in a draft and Murray would make notes and edits on it. And I would take those and reincorporate those and then he'd give more notes and edits. And this went on for like six or eight weeks until I guess he got tired of doing it and said, okay, we're, we're, you know, I'll take this, take this version. Uh, what is your page rate? And I said, ah. well, I don't know. I, I said, I don't know. I've never sold anything before. And he just was freaked out because uh, he had not realized that uh, I, I, I was not a professional. Wow. Um, but, but he, uh, he did buy, uh, end up buying the story. And oddly enough, from that point on, uh, I was selling stories uh, very regularly to Dick and uh, became the uh, uh, the writer of the interstitial material on House of Secrets that, uh, you know, went in between the stories, introduced the, the issue and so on, uh, and became his kind of go-to guy for the next year. Wow. So was it like, you know, Cain and Abel kind of scenes or were yeah, they just was, really, really short little well, gotcha kind were, of stories? It was all basically uh, stuff that uh, I did with, with Abel uh, talking to the reader, uh, sometimes, you know, we'd, we'd have like a shambling creature that'd come out, come out, come in from uh, the swamp, um, <laughs> and, and beautiful art by Bill Drought, uh, the, the cool. artist that I worked with on that. Yeah. Uh, but, it, but it was a real opportunity for me to, 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 uh, you know, get my foot in on writing a regular character and becoming a, integral part of a uh, an ongoing series uh, and in addition you know I wrote a lot of sh a lot of short uh, features for for Dick uh, and for Joe Orlando uh, Wow and one summer I <laughs> basically Dick had me writing romance comics for him um, wow. yeah because <laughs> he needed Roma's romance stories. Or I guess it was Young Romance or one of the uh, Young Love. I forget what what title. Sure. It was. Uh, and there I am, a sixteen year old kid writing these these romance stories from the point of view of a of a young woman, right? You know, <laughs> it's like what do I know? <laughs> but uh, you know, apparently he he liked them well enough, and uh, so for for a summer, I made a pretty decent salary uh, writing uh, romance stories. <laughs> you know, honestly, I don't know if, yeah. Go ahead. I would just said I don't know if any of them were ever printed. I mean, I think they probably were, but you know, it was a weird, a weird experience. <laughs> well, but the combination, honestly, of doing really short stories, I think, is great training ground. But oh, also absolutely. having to write a genre that maybe you weren't comfortable in, obviously, yes. kind of forced your head. And I had one conversation, or actually two, with Barbara Freelander, who was an editor of the romance stuff in the '60s. And she would mm. tell me stories about like guys like J. Scott Pike and the the great artists that didn't want to do superheroes. But man, you look at their stuff and it's like, oh my god, what what great art, you know? And those, yeah. I mean, really, those stories are they're fun to look at now. And I know they were important to girls of that era because my older cousins were reading that stuff. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Well, it also put me in this. It it, it, it gave me the. Uh, uh, the mindset of writing uh, stories that are emotionally based, you know, where, where uh, the, the uh, thrust of the story, the arc of the story is overcoming an emotional difficulty, which to me is, is the true solid values of any story is, is what, what emotions does it raise. So rather than doing uh, just tricky little plots, you know, plot twists, uh, like I did in the, um, uh, stories from House of Secrets or The Witching Hour, uh, these were more about emotional terms. And I think they, they helped uh, helped me develop uh, as a more mature writer, writer, you know, even though they were still very early, it's still very early in my career. I understand, man. And obviously uh, those kinds of stories would likely help you out when you eventually got the Spider-Man gig and everything. Absolutely. And I mean, Absolutely. you know, yeah, I mean, because that was always a running soap opera, definitely. Absolutely. Um, 
in the best way. Yeah, but in the best yeah. way, man. You know. Yeah. No, I mean, there's nothing wrong with soap opera. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a storytelling technique that we see, uh, you know, even today, and in, in many of the the successful uh, mainstream and fantasy series. I mean, look, Game of Thrones was a soap opera. Totally. <laughs> totally Absolutely. Was. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So. You know, one of my favorites from the early '70s, I Claudius. Uh, sure. You know, the, you know, yeah. No, I know exactly what you mean, man. And and it works so well for superhero stories. And it really, I mean, it seemed like, and maybe I'm misremembering because you you were reading, on, you know, I'm sure before you started being a pro. But it really felt like your generation was that first one that kind of added that third dimension to characterization, and we got past, you know, well, just good guy, bad guy, black hat, white hat. I think I think we have to give credit to uh, to Stan for that. Uh, in in the, I mean, he did it in a kind of a crude, primitive sort of way, uh, which is not not a criticism at all because that was the the format. I mean, that was the form that he was writing in was a was a, a, like a primitive form. Um, but what we what we did was we people like myself, Marv Wolfman, Len Wein, uh, Denny O'Neill, uh, Roy Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mike Friedrich, you know, we, we yes. came in and as fans, you know, we saw this material and we saw the opportunities of it and we just tried to take it to the next, uh, uh, the next level, you know, just to, to, to follow up, you know, what, what's sure. the, the path that Stan had, uh, had laid, um, and, and went, I think beyond what, what he had, did, where his comfort zone was. But it was also, you know, the nature of uh, the medium that he was working in at that time. Uh, the Understood. expectations. Totally. No, I I get you, man. Shaw has a great question here. What was your experience having Billy Graham on pencils for Luke Cage, Hero for Hire, number six? Did you have any interaction with him at all? That's a good uh, name to pull I, the I, I, I don't recall whether I had any uh, specific interaction with him, but, you know, he, what a great artist, you know, and... and, and it was a terrific opportunity to work with someone who actually knew something about the culture that we were doing, because uh, you know you had people like myself, George Tuska. I mean, we we for all the best intentions we might have, we had no real uh, uh, touchstone with with the culture uh, that we were trying to uh, portray. I mean, for me. Black culture was black exploitation films, you know, which is yeah, hardly, sure. you know, hardly an in-depth, uh, culturally sensitive view. Understood. Um, you know, I, I I knew black people, and I had, uh, I mean, I dated a black woman when I was in high school. Okay. Um, but you know, I didn't have any real cultural connection to it. Uh, so you know, having Billy, uh, you know, working on it. It gave it at least some level of authenticity that it might not have had otherwise. Understood. No, and also, I mean, that's why characters like Luke Cage and the Punisher, you know, really did come of the moment as far as headlines and pop culture as well. Sure. And, and yeah, I think that's that's exciting. I mean, really, that is what makes, I think, that early 70s Marvel period exciting. Marvel always, and DC did as well, it always reflected what were happening. It's funny. Yeah. A lot of people will look at Silver Age Superman covers, and you know, Alan Funt is on the cover, or Pat Boone is on the cover, and yeah, exactly. And everyone's like, "Oh, that's goofy," and it's like, "No, man. I mean, like, they were commenting on the culture of the moment. That was the yeah. point of putting those yeah. things in there." You know. Well, I mean, comics uh, even today are a reflection of the, of the larger culture. I mean, pop culture in in general is reflective. I think you know, it, it doesn't so much. You know, it's like an interaction and a, and a dialogue between um, uh, the consumers of the, of, the, of the pop culture and the creators of the pop culture. We're all part of the same moment. And uh, as a result, you know, we're, we're, it's a back and forth kind of uh, dialogue. Um, you know, the, the, the strength of pop culture is um, that it is responsive to the moment in a way that high art and high culture is not. And that's not a good or a bad thing. You know, I mean, it's, it's simply a strength um, because pop culture has to, it, it is, is uh, uh, commercialized 
that means that we have to actually address the things that people are consciously and unconsciously interested in. Um, we sure. can't simply step back and, and be observers. We have to be engaged. Understood. Absolutely, man. Scott Crosby is on Facebook, has a good question. Uh, evening from the UK, gentlemen. Hey, thanks yeah. for staying up, Scott. Yeah, uh, Mr. Very, very. <laughs> Mr. Conway, I loved your work for many years. I was wondering what your favorite Spider-Man arc is. Ah, well, I mean, among, among my own work, um, I think it, 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 since, since I worked on Spider-Man in two different eras, I'll, I'll pick two different arcs. Uh, I think that the, um, uh, the arc uh, between, uh, between the death of Gwen Stacy, including the death of Gwen Stacy, and uh, the, the uh, revelations of the spider clone, uh, are, that's, that's my favorite arc from that, that era. Uh, because it actually does sort of tell a complete story. And I think that, you know, it has a, a character growth, uh, an emotional arc for Peter and for uh, Mary Jane, and it has a resolution. Yep. So that's, to me, is, a, is the requirements of a, of a strong arc. Uh, and then in the second, in my second run on the book, I think the Tombstone uh, arc with Robbie Robertson uh, was my favorite, you know, of that. Uh, because again, it's a, it's a, it's a story. It's an arc. Uh, tells about uh, Robbie's backstory and uh, you know his um, uh, uh, early experiences and the consequences of, of his life. Uh, and all of that was kind of interesting and, and fascinating to me. And since I wasn't able to actually engage with the uh, the, the main characters in in that run because Spider Man was being written, Amazing Spider Man was being written by uh, David Michelini, uh, I had to, you know, deal with this, the secondary supporting cast. So it gave me a chance to feature, you know, Robbie. Um, and I liked doing that. Is that an editorial edict? You know, or was that, was it at the time to kind well, of it was, it was focus more, on the other characters? <laughs> it was more self-defense on my part. You know, I, I, uh, I sure. knew that, that if, if I was working on, Web and uh, Spectacular, which uh, I, think, I think I started on Spectacular and then was subsequently handed Web. I knew that those were the secondary books, you know, and uh, that David was going to have the, the primary uh, uh, responsibility uh, for, for crafting this, the, the Spider-Man arc. So nothing I would do would be relevant, you know, <laughs> thing I would do with or could be relevant and i mean i couldn't step on anything that, that david was going to do so i w w asked jim salakrop you know if it would be okay if if we could sort of sequester off you know this area uh which would be the secondary supporting cast uh robert robertson gloria grant uh sure. christy christy uh uh christy parker uh mary jane's uh niece uh, okay. And and all these you know characters that weren't really the focus, and and let me play in that little playground as if that's that's the uh, uh, the storyline. So, no, I get it, know. man. And thank you know in the case of Spider Man, thank God that you know he's got that kind of cast. I didn't mean to step out of you, Jerry. Sometimes we do that. What what were you going to say? I I felt like my response to no, you. No, that, that was it. Okay. No, that was it. I mean <laughs> There's no right, way to step good. on me because I'll just keep talking. <laughs> that's good. Well, that's why you're here, man. I get out. Of, I try to get out of the way and let you go. So another uh, Englishman uh, in San Diego, although he's uh, he's across the uh, ocean at, back in England again right now. With the rise of creator-owned non-superhero titles, curious which non-Cape comics Jerry's reading. I I actually mostly are you reading? Read on, yeah, I I do read comics, and I, I actually mostly read uh, non-Cape stuff. Uh, I mean, I, I find that I, I, it's hard for me to, to, to dip into uh, the, uh, the mainstream uh, hero books, you know, at Marvel and DC, because they're so continuity bound and they constant and, and they're also disrupted constantly by these event uh, series that uh, destroy the continuity. So it's, it's like, yeah. I, I, I just don't. I just don't find them very engaging. Uh, I, I 
among the, the ones that I do find engaging, I are like uh, Tom King's Batman. You know, I was really uh, oh, cool. thoroughly thoroughly in, uh, engaged with that, and before that, Scott Schneider uh, and Robert Venditti's Hawkman. I, I really like. Uh, Agreed. I'm, I'm credit I'm crediting the the writers, but you know, the obviously the artists are are equally part of this. Greg Capullo and uh, Brian uh, Hitch was with, with uh, Venditti. Brian Hitch, you know, and so on. Yeah. Um, and a but bunch of great of artists that, for top, yeah. Yeah, outside of that, I've, I really, really like uh, the, the, Mag, uh, the Mike Magnolia uh, Dark Horse universe. <laughs> I sure. really enjoy what he's doing there uh, because there's a, a whole bunch of interesting uh, side characters that he's elevated up into uh, mainline books. And uh, you know, he's taking a, a, a leaf from... Um, what I what, what I think is a strong suit in television right now, which is the limited series storytelling, uh, where you you introduce a uh, you know six part story and that's it, you know, and and then maybe you'll come back and do another six part story. Frankenstein um, was really good, of course, and uh, uh, you know his Baltimore I really liked. Uh, uh, yep. The the. Uh, uh, and, and then that, you know, I, 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 I'm a fan of uh, Sex Criminals by uh, Matt Fraction and uh, Jason Garski. Uh, I, I, I like that. Uh, I like a lot of European uh, books, uh, you know, that uh, are published in uh, uh, graphic novel. I mean, they're, they are graphic novels. So I, like, I like that. I tend to prefer graphic novel collections rather than individual titles. Uh, just because I, I like to read a complete story all at once. My memory is not good enough to keep me keep me engaged from one month to the next, <laughs> to be honest. I, I forget if, if I'm if I'm reading a, a series and uh, I'm in uh, issue three or four of uh, a, a six issue story, I have to go back and reread issues one, two and three and four just to know where five is. So I just wait and, and get the, uh, uh, the graphic. Uh, novel version of it, um, sure. but yeah, I mean that I, I'm very eclectic. You know, anything that sort of strikes my interest. Uh, the Umbrella Academy, I enjoyed. As a awesome, comic. Uh, yeah. Lock, Lock and Key, another terrific sure. uh, comic. Uh, the Boys, you know, all. all uh, I actually read all of these before they became TV sh series. So, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's given me insight into what's what's going on. Understood. I want to talk about your television work as well, because sure. uh, yeah, you had, a, I mean, good Lord, uh, that's a great period and a lot of procedurals and um, you know, I, uh, but uh, yeah, let's, let's stick on that for a minute. Um, sure. God, man, I really, I really enjoyed in particular diagnosis murder. And it was so, you know what really, I, I ended up watching it after it's run and I heard Dick Van Dyke in an interview refer to his character, Dr. Sloan, as hey, it's just Rod Petrie at seventy, and I'm like, I want to know what Rod Petrie's at seventy is doing. That sounds great because I always, I grew up on Dick Van Dyke, a great show. My God, amazing writing, and it and it was, it was comfortable, but also the stunts that you guys pulled on the show were very comic book centric. Where the crossovers, I don't know if you and forgive me, but like I loved the uh, the episode where uh, Mike Connors showed up as Mannix. And it really was. was uh, Go ahead. Yeah, that that was in the uh, second or third season, I think. Um, maybe the third season, and, and I was only partially involved uh, in the show okay. at that point. Uh, but yeah, we both both. Uh, I I think Dick is selling himself a little short by saying it's Rob Petrie at seventy because uh, there was a lot more. Uh, going on there, he was not. He was not playing it, uh, you know, as as this kind of jocular sort of character. He was a sure. Mark Sloan was was definitely a a much more serious and engaged character uh, than, than Rob. Uh, Rob was always like one step behind. Rob uh, uh, Mark Sloan was always one step ahead. Uh, very good, and absolutely, so sure. In, in that sense, uh, and he was a delight to work with. I mean, what an honor, you know. To, to, That's to, awesome. Man. I. I, I I, I was very lucky. I got to work with several people who were uh, uh, childhood heroes of mine, you know, over the years. I mean, Dick Van Dyke, obviously, uh, Raymond Burr, 
uh, on Perry yeah. Mason. Uh, yeah. uh, Vincent Nafrio, you know, who I, I loved before working with him on uh, Criminal Intent. You know, I, I had been a huge fan of his work on Full Metal Jacket uh, and uh, even Mystic Beat, you know, where you know, he, he plays this uh, wow. young stud. Uh, and right, Lily, wasn't charming. he Lily? Yeah, wasn't he Lily, uh, and I'm, I'm blanking on Lily, Lily, Lily Taylor. Wasn't he Lily Taylor's love interest in Lily that Taylor's movie? Boyfriend. Yeah, sure. her, her, her fiance, yeah. yeah. I went to high school uh, and, with and Lily. Terrific so, yeah. Son. Oh, That's yeah. cool, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, just a terrific actor and, and, and a great opportunity to, to work with him. Um, you know, so I've, I've been fortunate in that, in that sense, but Working yeah. on all these shows was kind of an accident. Um, I mean, you would think with my background that I would be working on science fiction and fantasy shows. Um, but what happened was uh, Roy Thomas and I had been a writing team and we were writing big budget science fiction and fantasy films for several years. Uh, and at one point, we pitched an idea that uh, ended up at Showtime for a uh, like a, a, a parody uh, of Republic serials that would have a uh, would be this this like interstitial series that would run for like fifteen minutes in between movies or other shows sure. and feature this you know kind of pulpy serial type thing set in the 30s. Uh, and at the end of each episode, there'd be a choice, you know, which way would the, would, would, what would the character do? Cool. Um, and then the following episode would, would pick up and go in that direction and, and viewers would be able to call in and pitch their, you know, make their choice. Um, anyway, but never, it never went, but in the course of working on it, we met, uh, we, we were, put together with an executive producer who had just signed um, uh, with Viacom that owned Showtime, uh, Dean Hargrove. And Dean was this legendary showrunner who had worked on uh, Columbo, uh, you know, had worked on uh, The Name of the Game, uh, had written yeah. for A Man from Uncle. I mean, just this terrific uh, uh, portfolio of, of experience. And we hit it off with him because we were all serial fans, you know? Sure. Well, after Roy and I broke up as a writing partnership, um, I was like floundering around a little bit. This was during a, a crisis period in my life. Uh, and I went and tried to find advice, you know, get advice. I, I was told, basically, if you wanna get your career going again, talk to people you know who are successful and ask their advice. So I, Talked to a whole bunch of people. I talked to Joe Struzinski. I talked to uh, people at, at Marvel. You know, I talk, and I talked. I talked to Dean, and Dean thought I was actually coming in asking for a job. So he gave me one. Wow, <laughs> awesome. that's what happened. He gave me a he gave me a crack at writing an episode uh, of a show for him. Uh, he liked it. He hired me to write another episode for uh, Father Dowling. Okay, uh, great job, Bosley. Absolutely, man. Yes, right? indeed. and. Spin off of as a result, Yeah. As a result of that, he uh, uh, hired me to be uh, a story editor on Father Dowling and then promoted me up to producer. And wow. from there, I became typecast as a writer of mysteries. <laughs> and I could not get hired on any fantasy show because I was a writer of mysteries. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> crazy. That's, yeah. 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 Really, honestly, man, that's, that's kind of crazy. I, I, I pitched. I pitched myself to Lois and Clark. Couldn't get hired. I wow! Pitched myself You're a to, Superman to, writer, and they could. That I makes know. no sense. I pitched myself to Birds of Prey. Couldn't get hired. Wow! I pitched myself to Smallville. Couldn't get hired. I mean, it was crazy. Uh, but I did get hired on uh, Law and Order, and I did get hired on Law and Order: Criminal Intent. <laughs> so, Sorry. You know, yeah. Yeah. Exactly, I, man. No, just the you know. That. Yeah, the prestige show. Sorry, man. That yeah. sucks. You know, yeah. Jesus, that's amazing, man. Yeah, we got that's nominated crazy. for an Emmy. I was up there for an Emmy, you know, so yeah, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> well, the, there's a reason that show is still on the air 20 years later. My God, 20 plus years later. Good Lord. Man, yeah. you know, and again, we're we're close enough in, in age and everything. It's like, you know, the gun smokes and the bonanzas and the things that did last for more than a decade. 
God only knew, you know, it, it's surprising when shows like that, especially in yeah. the face of where we are now in television. And it's interesting, I think, and I and really wanted to hear your opinion. What do you think of both the uh, one story per season format that television has become? And I'll be honest, I'm a, I'm a massive Star Trek fan. I don't think they, they do it quite well on, on Discovery or Picard. Those Both of those shows disappointed me where I feel, and maybe it is that that in the back of my head that Star Trek needs to be the problem of the week, but I, but I, I just felt, you know, whatever. And I also think that in some cases, it seems like the, the, the weekly procedural and the problem of the week are just still doing fine with, yeah. with you know, facing, facing the overarching story plot for the season kind of shows. Well, I mean, when you're doing a 22 episode uh, series, which is what network TV, you know, is uh, doing a, doing a single story arc for, for uh, that, uh, that long a, a season is, is difficult as, as 24, the, the series 24. Mode. Yes. Uh, it's, it's hard to maintain, uh, you know, interest. There have been shows that that did it. I think Fringe did it uh, pretty well, and Person of Interest did it pretty well. Sure. Uh, but then there are other shows, you know, where uh, it sort of flounders a bit, like Lost. You know, where it 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 holds together and then it slips, and then it holds together and it becomes difficult. Um, when on the other hand, the, and that that's where the procedural type show or the 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 episodic show works. Yeah. You know, in network and network is also because it's a uh, an over the air, theoretically over the air uh, uh, model, it invites more uh, casual viewing. So you can't really do a, 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 a strong continuous story that requires you to follow episode after episode, uh, especially if the, the, the story is intricate enough that it requires you to go back and check, <laughs> which is very hard to do yeah. with broadcast TV. Uh, however, when you get to th shows like Netflix or um, uh, I mean, uh, streaming uh, 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 opportunities like Netflix or Amazon, um, or maybe even CBS Access, you know, um, they, they give you the, op they, they almost require you to create a single story uh, season because you have only 10 episodes. Uh, 10 episodes seems to be what Netflix has settled on. And sure. uh, w when, when you have 10 episodes, 10 individual stories kind of feels like one-offs. You know I mean, it, it doesn't feel as engaging and it's, it, it's less satisfying to binge. You know, because there's no there's no True. big payoff, you know, to the whole thing. So I, I think that for, for for that, you know, I think that format works. You know, uh, when it's a when it's a short format season, that's where I mean, a, a, a good example of a, a, like a, a kind of a hybrid is the Good Place, which was a network show but felt like a uh, bingeable oh, yeah. uh, Netflix show. Absolutely, yeah, there was a continuing show. story, but it was also only thirteen episodes. Yep. Very smart show, and I, I and it really blew as a broadcast nerd. I mean, I've been working in radio for thirty years uh, and a little TV, but it blew my mind that uh, NBC because that's the kind of show yeah. that would be uh, you know six didn't find its audience. See you later, and then it becomes one of those forgotten gems that you know again us broadcast nerds will be like, oh, you remember VR five or you remember uh, you know <laughs> Nowhere Man on UPN or some of these other yeah. shows like that. No, I'm with you, man. Absolutely. Oh, here, uh, Englishman says procedurals, which have many arcs of returning characters, are more like presents for longtime fans. That's right. Well, uh, it, and, and in Law and Order Criminal Intent, we had um, a one continuing storyline that sort of dropped in and out, which was uh, Goran versus his Moriarty, uh, this female Moriarty character. And uh, we would we would do one or two of those a season just to sort of like keep keep you interested, you know. Like, and it, and it's just a little gift, you know, to to the uh, to the viewer uh, who follows the series long enough. Uh, 
but for the most part with with procedurals you're you're sort of structuring those for the casual viewer understood oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, gersten makes a good point here that the british have been doing limited series on tv for yes. decades get in tell the story and be done yes you know the original life on mars I, I was I loved that show the British version of the mm -hmm. show yes. and I remember seeing some of the behind the scenes stuff and the the uh, producers were like look and it was the second season and they're like look we can't be quantum leap and have this guy in a coma forever and having yeah. these adventures it has to end and it's like yeah. oh man tell that to the LA uh, side of the yeah. business yeah and well, the American what... and the American model yeah yeah and the Amer and the American uh, uh, show did not work. You know, I mean, the American version of Life on Mars didn't work. No. Um, yeah, and the other the other advantage that that uh, the British uh, uh, television industry has that the American uh, uh, version is slowly coming around to is the idea of the single author limited s series. Yeah. Uh, they do the their six their six episode comedic series. You know, I mean, Fleabag is the obvious, you know, uh, exemplar of this, but Absolutely. it's not the only one. There's lots of them, uh, you know, where, where, you know, a, a uh, comedian has an idea for a show, writes the show, stars in the show, directs the show, and it's got a whole uh, 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 creative uh, 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 solidity. And uh, in America, we do that with, with some shows, you know, like Fargo. Uh, was is completely written by Noah Hawley. Yes, uh, but because of the the twenty two episode uh, network model, uh, where there's a predisposition to the notion of a writers room, uh, and writers rooms are great, but they also diffuse the uh, personality of a show Understood. Uh, to to a degree. You know, I mean, usually. I have been in a lot of them and in various yeah. kinds of them. What generally happens is you're writing the show, the showrunner wants you to write. And it's the, and in many cases, the showrunner will rewrite scripts so that they sound very much like uh, the show that, you know, that yeah, the voice of the show, sure. Yeah. yeah. But it's still, it's still a bit of a clutch. You know, it's still, uh, I mean, one of the reasons I was really effective in television writing was because I was used to writing in other writers' voices, you know, like t taking taking on Spider Man after Stan Lee, I had to write in a in a in a way that would not seem so completely alien to a fan of Stan's writing Absolutely. that they'd stop reading the book. Sure. Um, and ditto, you know, when I when I would do things at uh, at DC, following another stronger writer. Uh, yeah, no. Well, thank you, to, thank you, John. <laughs> I was going to say, man, they're they're loving what you're what you're talking about. And John had a question, a, a comic question. And and forgive me, everybody. It just truly, after having several conversations with Jerry, I really wanted to, uh, and especially the changes in television. It's an area that I really wanted to hit. But sure. John wanted to ask about uh, your classic satellite era JLA run, including the legendary two hundredth issue. Sure. Well, I. To, to me, writing Justice League was uh, literally the, the, the dream job of my uh, early childhood. Uh, one bet. of the first, one of the first books that I fell in love with was Justice League. Uh, I think I picked it up with issue two. So you know, it was, it, it was even before even before Fantastic Four. Um, and I loved that book, and I loved the way that Gardner Fox structured mm -hmm. the stories. Um, I. I they, they were charmingly stupid, you know. I mean, they're, they're stupid, <laughs> stupid stories. Uh, but what was so fun about them was that taking these characters and and creating these little mini teams that would go off and uh, uh, operate, you know, on separate aspects of the bigger problem. Yeah. Uh, and that was a, a brilliant way to uh, to structure the stories. I, of course, being also a Marvel fan, I wanted to inject. You know, character and uh, conflict. You know, emotional conflict into the stories. So, uh, uh, I what I tried to do was to take the Gardner Fox struct story structure and uh, the Stanley uh, character-based conflict and bring those together. You know, into into the, the book. Uh, issue two hundred was 
like a gift. I mean, the, the, when I realized that we were, that I was going to be in a position to write 200, Len Wein was my editor and I, uh, we just went, we were started saying, okay, what would be the, what would be the best possible thing we could do? And, uh, the thought of structuring that as, uh, a tribute to those old Gardner Fox, uh, Mike Sikowski, uh, issues where, you know, you broke up into teams and then getting the artists who were most identified with those particular characters to draw those stories. What, what a wonderful, uh, what a wonderful break that was. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm so proud, you know, of that, that story, uh, to me, that was peak just this week in, in my personal run. Yeah, I really enjoyed uh, working on Justice League. Uh, I, I was know, one of those readers. Fanboy. Yeah. yeah. No, I get it. Absolutely, man. And and how fun were the – and then did you – how many of the uh, JLA, JSA crossovers were you able to do? Uh, I think I probably – well, let's see. I was on the book for nine to ten years. So Damn. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's great, so I, man. <laughs> I, I think I ended up doing nine or ten of them, yeah. Uh, and they got longer and longer. I mean – the by by the time we got to the crisis, the, fi the final crisis one, uh, just be I think the year before I uh, I, I took it to to Detroit, um, we did a a crossover with Infinity Inc. that was like six six issues. You know, it started and in, started in Infinity Inc. went to Justice League, went to Fini Infinity Inc. went back to Justice League, went to it. I mean, it was like six five or six issues. <laughs> So it was really, really crazy, um, but uh, I love doing those. I mean, it, it, what became weird though is that after a while, it felt like the issues between because I would do two part stories, uh, and and sometimes three part stories, but mostly two part stories. Okay. Uh, that we would only end up with like four stories in between uh, the annual crossovers. So it's like. It, it felt like the crossovers were the book and uh, the individual stories were sort of filler. <laughs> I understand. I would, Absolutely. Yeah. I'd have to start thinking about what am I going to do next, next year for the crossover almost immediately upon finishing one. Wow. Look at all right, John is uh, playing some of your greatest hits here, man. Uh, Raw flush gang and the menagerie and ultra humanite, of course. Absolutely, yeah. man. And uh, yeah. the classic All Star Stradron JLA JSA crossover, yes, indeed. Yeah, for Degaton, yeah. Well, I had I, I was really fortunate. I had George uh, drawing that one because uh, he just he loved. I mean, it, it, there's a reason his eyesight went, <laughs> you know, because he really, really loved doing that really intricate uh, character work. And uh, you know, there is nobody like him. Uh, nobody like yeah. him uh, yeah. for that kind of book. He was perfect for that book. I love how, you know, again, Taste Boomerang and uh, Justice League Detroit has is this, like, inspiration for really the modern CW, uh, yeah. uh, you know, Arrowverse and everything. And it's, I mean, having conversations with Jeff Johns and Brad Meltzer and Judd Winnick and people like that that, you know, really did adore JLA I'm Detroit. Not everything it's pretty that's got to feel good man that you know like well, i said because i remember yeah. as a contemporary reader you know yeah i mean they, they kind of yeah exactly man i see the kind of bashful look on your face but that's all right man i mean hey you you, you try to tell an interesting story at the end of the day well, with new characters know, it, too. It, it, comic readers are, are uh they're, they're an odd bunch you know i mean and i put myself i put myself in that category because you know I, i'm just as I'm just as weird, you know, in my tastes. Uh, I want something that's new, but I also don't want it to change anything. <laughs> yep. Yeah. No, it's so, the familiar is really important what, to comic yeah, book readers. 100%, man. I get exactly what you're saying. Go on. And, and my, my goal, I mean, I thought it was actually a fairly, uh, it, I, I didn't expect it to be as, as controversial as it would be. I mean, I, I mean, foolishly, you know, I mean, obviously. Because what I was doing was something that I had al that had already uh, had already been done, you know, in a different book, which was in the Avengers. Um, it with uh, issue uh, uh, 
20, I guess it was, the or 15. I forget. I forget when it was. I know what you're talking about. Go on. They, they they wrote out the main characters, you know, the 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 uh, the, the superheroes, and introduced basically a, a, a B team with Captain America as the leader of it, and that was that the vision. Team, yeah, Vision, yeah. Scarlet Witch, and well, Hawkeye. Yeah, Vision came in later, but but the oh, initial B Scott. team. Go ahead. The initial B team was uh, uh, Quicksilver, Scarlet Witch, and Hawkeye. Yes. Um, and Captain America. And and the advantage to that for for Stan was that he could focus his stories on character development in that group, which he couldn't do when the group was for Iron Man, Hulk, you know, uh, Giant Man, and, uh, you know, all these characters that had their own titles. Yep. Um, so he did it for a very, very, uh, I mean, for a creative reason, and it was very successful. So I was looking at a similar problem, which was that our sales on Justice League <coughs> were still good, but they were, but they were flat. And we wanted to, to reinvigorate the book. And I wanted to tell more involved personal stories. So I said, hey, let's, let's crib from uh, the, the master, you know, and, and uh, do an Avengers uh, here, you know, and, and bring in the second, second team, the B team. Uh, and that's, you know, for, for people who were new to the book, it was great. You know, somebody like Jeff Johns, who was, I think, eight or nine, you know, when that happened, uh, it was an easy way in for him. For uh, Brad was the same, you know. Judd Winnick is the same. Um, and Mark Guggenheim, you know, the same. You know, they could all come in at a at just the right age for it. But anybody who was who was 12, 13, 14, 15, they were pissed because <laughs> what they wanted was what they had always had. They just wanted right. it better, you know, in some way. Right, um, the eighteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 18. I'm with you, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, my theory on all this is that, you know, if you want enduring, enduring, uh, fandom, uh, what you do is you, you write for people who are young enough. Uh, I mean, you write for young, the youngest possible audience, not the oldest possible audience. And those people eventually grow up and then discover, you know, then, then you become a hero to them when they're old enough to uh, keep you keep you uh, 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 going to conventions and stuff, <laughs> or or bring your or bring your characters into TV shows. You know that that was my uh, uh, my gift. You know. Well, and and I'm not uh, forgive me, but like you are being compensated for all these uh, concepts that you created that yeah, are for, being for the most part. TV. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, for the most great. Part, yes. Hey, man. Well, you know, we all know. Thank God, Len. We at least got one big check before before he passed away, and we all know that he should have gotten a hell of a lot more. And uh, that you can, you know, and that's the case for dozens of creators that really oh, came up with these amazing ideas. There are there are many people who have, who have not benefited, you know, over the decades, you know, from uh, their creative work, and uh, that's an ongoing problem. You know, I mean, at the very least, I I feel people should be getting credit, you know, uh, on screen credit for their work. Uh, totally, but you know, it, it it's an it's an evolving position. Agreed. Know, but both companies are are doing a hell of a lot better now than they did twenty years ago, uh, and uh, I expect that they will continue to do better because the people that are creating for them now have many more options, you know, and and have much more leverage. Uh, Agreed. You know, if if you want the the the, the next uh, uh, project from Matt Fac Fracton. You have to compete with Matt Fracton, <laughs> you know, who has his yeah. own career and has yep. his own fan base. And if you know, he he's not going to have to do it for you. Uh, yeah, you know, honestly, I I, uh, I I keep making that point when I talk to current creators and and creators that have have done this for several years, like yourself. In terms of, isn't it interesting that the pinnacle was writing for DC or Marvel? And now it's taking that DC and Marvel un uh, readership with you to these yep. new things that you create. So yeah, and also Jerry, what do you think of um, as you mentioned, you know, twenty years? Um, what do you think of from the publishing side? Because with the changes now, 
both at DC and even Marvel with uh, Kevin Feige taking over, at least over overseeing the publishing side. Mm -hmm. I sometimes wonder if, and it's easy with hindsight to say this, that the publishers kind of squandered the last 20 years and didn't see the changes in the younger audience, what they're reading. Um, the, the, the young adult world has certainly exploded in a comic book way. Yeah. And, and 10 years ago, and I think it's still obviously out there, manga having a big influence on younger readers and things. So yeah, what do you, like again, uh, it, like I said, it's easy with hindsight to Monday oh, morning sure. quarterback that stuff. But yeah, any, any thoughts about what oh, they've been I've doing? I, I, I'm not exactly Monday morning quarterback because I've been quarterbacking this for 20 years, you know, saying <laughs> you guys have got to, you've got to change your model. Um, I mean, with, with no, no offense to the, uh, to, to, to the uh, many fine people, you know, who follow comics today, uh, but they're an insignificant aspect of, of the overall audience for, for I'm, I'm just talking about, superheroes uh but but also about the the genre of uh fantasy storytelling and and visual storytelling that comic books uh presents um the the the, the best-selling comic you know uh today might sell a hundred thousand copies on a regular basis uh you compare that to the audience for a single mcu movie or a single um, uh, CW Arrowverse show. Yeah, it's insignificant. I mean, it's yes. just totally insignificant. Um, and and you you have fans of these characters who have never read a comic book. Uh, you know, there was uh, my my daughter who is a huge MCU fan. Uh, I mean, I'm huge. I mean, just loves this stuff. You know, she's 24 years old and she has never read a superhero comic book other than Watchmen, because she was assigned Watchmen in her school, at her school. Wow, that's great. Right? Yeah. Uh, I, I couldn't get her to read comics because they they were too confusing. Uh, you know, there's too much stuff that she had to know to go into reading an individual issue of a comic. And that is just ass backwards, you know. Um, be that as it may, I mean, you, can, you obviously the, the, the fans uh, because they, they control the uh, uh, comic book store marketplace uh, are the and that's the only place that you can sell comic books. <laughs> you know the, the, it's, it's kind of a death spiral that uh, the, the business has been in for 20 to 30 years, you know. Um, create, creatively, some of the best work in, in, is being done now that, that's, that's ever been done but it's going to a small sliver of a potential audience. Agreed. Um, I don't know how you get around it other than to, I mean, if, you know, if I was king of the world uh, and had had the, the power to enforce my will, you know, what I, I would do is I would stop publishing comics uh, right now. And then uh, at both publishers, um, analyze what is the fundamental appeal of each of these characters you know what is the most iconic and uh the most uh, uh not stereotypical but but emblematic aspects of these characters and reintroduce all of these books with new new number ones new origin stories, new, you know, updated in the moment and without ties to any continuity that's pre-existed. And sort of what they tried to do with um, uh, the ultimate Marvel Universe and did yes. very successfully. Uh, but at the same time, I would try to, to keep these storylines really condensed so that they don't spiral out of control. You know, they don't become in this whole nonsense, which is pure marketing of these uh, crossover events and uh, inter intercompany events, because that's just marketing. That's got nothing yes. to do with creativity. Yeah. And then every three years or so, just slow things down, stop, and reinvent the characters for the next generation of readers. Wow. It used to be the theory 
you know, I mean, Marvel and DC both were able to do this until the 70s. <laughs> but it used to be the theory that your readership only read comics for about three years. Uh, that readership was about nine years old to 13 years old, you know, somewhere okay. in that range. Sure. And Julie Schwartz actually said this to me at one point, you know, because uh, I was talking about something. This is back during that tour group period. Uh, I was talking about some Green Lantern story and saying, you know, I'd really like you to, I'd really like to see this character again. And he said, how old are you? And I said, I'm 14. He said, you don't count. <laughs> it's like, you know, you know you are, you're already out of the market. You know, I'm yeah, not, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not interested in what you have to say, you know, from, from my point of view. And, sure. you know, I was offended, but <laughs> the, the, the marketplace that he was actually dealing with, that was the marketplace. And if you look at the comic books, the superheroes that we see uh, in the MCU and so on, there is a continuity there, but it's not a continuity that requires you so much to actually pay attention for more than about two or three years at a time. Because each of, the, each of the arcs only lasted, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. Those were all self-contained story arcs. And then they sort of re you know, resituated things and then did the next story arc. And then they resituated things and then did the next story arc. It was very clever. And I think you can do the same kind of thing with comics in general without like negating continuity, but just by simply reestablishing, you know, Peter Parker should never grow older than 17. Um, Aquaman should never get married to Mera. Uh, <laughs> Batman should probably always have a sidekick, but you know, whether that sidekick gets killed or not, I don't know, you know, but I think there's a, there's an appeal to a dark knight, but who has a sidekick? I mean, all of these things are, are part of the, uh, uh, the aspect of those characters that makes them those characters, you know, and, uh, to the extent that we sort of move away from those and, and, and come up with new complications and come up with things that, that uh, add levels and, and sophistication, all of which is great, but irrelevant to the readership. Uh, they're great for the readers. They're great for the adult readers. But the actual readership that you probably want to be reaching is it's not relevant to them. That's my well, no, it's all good, man. And and I, you know, I, I'd give the uh, the old Paso commercial uh, response of "Can we have both?" Because again, <laughs> I mean, look at look yeah. at us all being older readers that still enjoy. Well, yes, I think we could, you know, but we'd have to sort of accept that we should be secondary. In other Agreed. words, it's, it's sort of like the Grateful Dead. Let me let me use the Grateful Dead as an analogy. <laughs> uh, you know, if you're if you're a fan of the Grateful Dead, you listen to anything they did. You know, by, by the end of their career, you know, by the end of Jerry Garcia's career, sure. um, you know, you just love the Grateful Dead. And it didn't matter that they weren't really as good as they had been those first three or four albums, you know. I'm with you. Yeah, uh, yeah. But if you were going to introduce somebody to the Grateful Dead, you wouldn't have given them the, you know, one of the Roadshow albums from, you know, one of the, 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 the uh, uh, yeah. bootleg tapes. You would yeah, have given yeah. them one of the first albums. Sure. <laughs> and that's sure. what we need to do in comics. You Funny. know, let's have a separate genre, you know, that, that maybe comes out with three books a year, you know, for each character, uh, what, graphic novels that are just for that, just for us, you know, but the main books should be the equivalent of Walt Disney comics and stories. Uh, you know, they, yeah. they, they should be, about the Marvel, the MCU character versions of, of Marvel characters, or the sure. the uh, uh, Arrowverse version of DC character, whatever it is, because that's what people are re want to read. You know, I hear you, I, man. The, the one the one last thing I'd say on this is that I had a friend uh, who was a producer on Law and Order, and he told me how uh, his uh, nephew had asked him, you know, had found out that you know I used to write comics. And uh, said, you know, he, 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 he wanted to read some comics. He was a kid. He was like 10 years old kid. And uh, my friend had said, uh, you know, so I went in, went into this store, uh, you know, in these comic book stores to buy a, a copy of Superman for him. And he said there were like 12 different 
versions of Superman. And I, yeah. I, and I, I was sort of like, what, what, I just want Superman. You know, where's Superman? I don't know what I should get here. Now, when that's the reality that you can't figure out how to introduce your 10 year old kid to Superman, you have a fucked business model. That's Sorry really for my funny. language, you two. No, 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 it's all good. You can, <laughs> no, no, no. You can drop that box. Uh, it's quite all right. That is a bad business model. It's, there is no way, other way to describe it. Yeah. You know, uh, because if you can't introduce a new reader to your, to your product, you're done. I, I don't uh, disagree, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hear exactly what you're saying. And it's funny. Glad you used the Grateful Dead analogy because uh, I worked at the uh, Chicago Grateful Dead station for 10 years, the progressive rock station, WXRT. Yeah. So, you know, when, you know, it's funny, Jerry, I would see you at uh, not only comic conventions, but I was always excited to see you and I wouldn't want to bother you too much, but at pulp conventions like the Windy City Pulp yes. Show. And yeah. I'd see you digging through, man, looking for old pulps and I'm, you know, right there with you. So I, I always that was always a kick seeing you. It does. Let me tell you, this is a, this is also relevant to the comic book thing because uh, I, I I was a pulp collector. I was collecting a bunch. Of, I I realized I couldn't really afford to be a comic book collector. <laughs> Those things are ridiculously overpriced. But I could buy pulps. You know, I mean, even at the most expensive level, I could get a complete run of Doc Savage. You know, wow. for a re for a reasonable amount of money, right? Okay, I mean, you know, not sure. not when I say reasonable, you know, for, as the collector. I'm so, with you. But I would go to these conventions, and if at one point I, I, I'm saying I'm thinking, wow, this is great. I'm having fun collecting this stuff, and I'm I, I'm getting together a legacy that I can give to my kids so that they can you know have something to to inherit and make money off of, you know selling. Okay. And then I looked around. Then I looked around and it suddenly hit me that the youngest person in the room was about 45. Yep. And I thought to myself, I have got to start selling my pulps. <laughs> you know? No, you're right. Well, because we're they not got, bringing in any new people here. <laughs> no, they got, you know, and my feeling was, Jerry, is again, because I grew up on those paperback reprints in the 70s, that at least for me started mm -hmm. in the 70s. I know they yeah. were coming yeah. out earlier than that. But, but you know, th I don't know if it was the rights holders got precious with the characters and wouldn't when people were nosing around about possible comic book adaptations or whatever. But, yeah, you're. I mean, 20 years of not publishing new stuff, you lose that audience. That's a whole generation yeah. of potential fans. Yeah. And, and, yeah, I mean, I, that's, you know, again, I, I get it. So, so, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's like it was uh, Brian Azzarello. And I can't remember what it was called. I'm sure someone in the chat might remember what it was called. But they DC ten years ago, 50, 50, I don't even remember when. But they had Superman, or rather Batman, crossing over with Doc Savage and a couple of the other mm -hmm. pulp heroes. Sure. And Brian wrote it. And I'm like, who's excited about this? You know, like who's this being written for? He's like, nobody. You're like the oldest. You're the youngest uh, reader that would give yeah. a shit about this stuff. And I get it. I totally get it. And I'm like, yeah, I, I you know, again, and it's a shame because they're. There are great concepts in the palms, yeah. and that, and I mean, that some of that writing is kind of you know dated, well, obviously, but that's yeah, fair yeah. to say about stuff that came out in the '30s and '40s and '50s. Yeah. So you know, you, you take it in context, and it's uh, that's the best way to read any pop culture stuff is in context, because you know, in, in cultural context of the time. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you, Richard. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he sold his palms in under horrendous distress. I can appreciate yeah. that. It's hard because what I realized was that I was never going to make back the money that I, I put into it. Uh, but yeah, you know, it was still uh, it's still something. I still have my my almost complete run of Doc Savage. I'm missing only a, a issue one. Uh, wow! I I have a substantial collection of Shadow, um, terrific, and some Dime Mystery and Dime Detectives. Uh, beyond that, I, I basically sold off all the other pulps uh, through my daughter, I, my older daughter. Uh, I shipped them my contents of my storage unit <laughs> and said, here, get what you can for it. And they, they made some money, you know, uh, but it was free money for them, you know, and it's basically me giving it to them. Uh, but in terms of, you know, uh, return on, on investment, it was not never going to be what it was what no it was. i get it man like i said yeah the 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 audience has aged out and then like i said the yeah. the the 
the rights holders haven't done a good job maintaining the 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 property to to expose to a, a new generation and give them a facelift of some sort. So yeah. I you know I we've been going for a little over an hour, Jerry, and I know it's getting closer to dinner time. I don't want to mess you up, but do you have time for just a couple more chat questions? Yeah, let's do, let's talk for another five minutes or so. Okay, that'd be great. Here we'll we'll go through some lightning round stuff. Uh, Richard wanted to know what you thought of the uh, Punisher's uh, Netflix stuff with John Barrett. I, I I loved it, and John is a sweetheart. Uh, so you know, it, it was great actor. I think a very a very uh, a very timely adaptation of material for the for the current time. Understood. And John wanted to know if there were any favorite Punisher runs that you've enjoyed. Uh, well, uh, I I I guess I would say the original Steve Grant. Uh, Mike Zick uh, miniseries was sure. uh, is my favorite of that. Bunch. I, I did also enjoy uh, uh, Garth Ennis's uh, run. That was neat. Uh, and uh, Ed Brubaker, I think, was, has done a run recently that that uh, is pretty good. So you know, every writer it sort of takes a uh, it's a Rorschach test. You know, every every writer takes their own uh, cultural experience to it and, and brings out something new. Agreed. I, um, I'll tell you, I, let's see. Oh, can uh, Jerry talk about the Conan the Destroyer movie script? Yes, please. <laughs> Any contact with yeah. Arnold? Uh, yeah, actually, I, I had contact with Arnold at the premiere. Uh, <laughs> That's we, cool. We wrote a, we, uh, Roy and I wrote a, uh, a first draft uh, working with the director, Roger, uh, Roger Donaldson, uh, who um, is a, was a New Zealand director who uh, had come to Hollywood uh, based on one of his films, uh, was hired by Ed Pressman, who was the executive producer at the time. Um, and we worked out a really, what we thought was a really solid script and he thought was a really solid script. Uh, and Ed then sold the project to Dino De, Dino De Laurentiis, who immediately moved Roger over to direct the bounty. Uh, and then for a year, Roy and I worked with a, a variety of uh, stand-in directors uh, who were brought in by Dino to sort of like experiment with the script. Uh, and we did, I think, six or seven rewrites, uh, complete page one rewrites uh, and just burned out on it. Uh, by the time Dino finally settled on uh, Richard Fleischer, uh, we were pretty much burned out on the project and uh, had lost whatever energy we had originally had brought to it. But ironically, after, uh, and so we, were, we at that point we were replaced for business reasons because uh, Dino didn't want to pay us uh, money that we would have been due if we had had sole screenplay credit. Um, we were replaced as, as writers uh, and ended up going to the uh, premiere and met Arnold, you know, finally, after all that time. And, and, and Arnold was like, was, was like, oh, you know, you guys, I, I, I signed on to, to, to make your, your, your movie, you know, based on your script, that, that script. Uh, you know, that was a good script. I don't know why we didn't shoot that script. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. Jeez. Yeah. I hear it was bad. <laughs> well, you know, but yet, you know, it's still, I mean, you know, those, those yeah. movies are so yeah. amazing. Yeah. And, and, you know, I love too, prior to that, uh, you and Roy writing, uh, Fire and Ice. Yes. And uh, working with Batchkey and Rosetta. Yeah. That was a weird, great but movie. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Um, all right. Let's see. Uh, now, Richard asks through uh, Gersten, and then obviously, you know, he he doesn't it doesn't want to sound harsh, but yes, do you regret killing Gwen Stacy? Not at all. Not at all. Yes. <laughs> and I, mean, and I, what, did, I, did. I was going to say, yeah, as a two part thing, is there a story that any story that you regret writing, as far as any ed ed editorial direction, or or even one that you wrote yourself? So yeah, the two part question. Yeah. I don't regret killing off Gwen Stacy. Uh, I think she's a character who has gained much more weight uh, uh, because of her death uh, than she had as a, uh, a character when she was, quote, alive. 
uh, she, you know, she uh, was a bland uh, uh, kind of generic girlfriend character, uh, but her death gave her tragedy and weight. So from that point of view, you know, it, it enhanced her as a character. And I don't think you'd have, for example, a Spider-Gwen series uh, if, uh, if not for that. Uh, um, and I also don't regret really it because it's the story that I'm most famous for, you know, uh, in, in comics history. And it, and it had a, a real emotional impact uh, that has echoed, you know, for 40 plus years. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of it. Uh, in terms of regrets, uh, editorial pushing, I don't, there, there haven't been many times when editors push me to do things that I didn't want to do. So uh, I can't really think of something that an editor screwed up. I probably screwed stuff up myself, uh, you know, and, and have blanked it from my mind. <laughs> Fair enough. In a, mer in a mercy. That's funny. Sean oh, makes yes, a good point absolutely. here. Yes, if, if Twitter were around during Gwen's death, Jerry would have gotten an oh, earful. Yeah. I would have been, I would have been well, slammed. And I was how, slammed how with the letters. I was going to say, oh. yeah, the letter columns. Yeah, man. I mean, because a lot, I mean, thankfully, editorial can obviously decide not to publish letters, unlike Twitter, where anything goes, as you know. So, yeah. Well, it was, uh, I, I received a ton of hate mail. Uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the book received a ton of hate mail, and I personally received a lot of hate mail. Jeez. And I, I got a lot of hate when I would go to conventions. So I actually stopped going to conventions for about 10 years. Wow. 10, 10 years. Uh, wow. Just because I, I hated the amount of hate that I got. Now, you know, it's kind of jocular and fun. Uh, people, you know, tease me about it because it's well accepted, you know, at this point. Uh, but back then, uh, the, the, the rawness of the wound, uh, you know, affected uh, the, the readers. As we say, readers, you know, were, uh, are, are, they want change, but they want everything to remain the same. So Absolutely. That, and to be fair, that was a really shocking uh, development that, that turned a lot of uh, storytelling on its head for the, the next decade or two. As I said, Jerry, nine years old. I, you see, I was one of those young readers that, sure. in the best yeah. way, in the well, best I'm way, glad it was like, in the best way. Absolutely, man. No, I don't want that misunderstood. Now, Jakiro asked what you've been reading recently. We did cover that earlier, Jakiro. So I advise you to rewind and, and listen because I, I, I will <laughs> wrap up with Jerry uh, because you've been incredibly kind with your time and also good news for everybody watching. Jerry's going to come back and be part of Baltimore Comic Con online in just around a month. It'll be October. Uh, either we're not sure yet if it'll be Saturday or Sunday, the twenty fourth or twenty fifth. Uh, and Jerry can tell me his convenience to that, and we will schedule accordingly. But uh, Brian Bendis and Jerry will have a nice conversation about uh, their historic runs. And I'll be, I'll be honest, Jerry, we didn't even talk about you know the the swings you took at the Spider Man world in recent years with Ryan Stegman and the like as well. And th those were excellent stories. And uh, yeah, man, well, hopefully, you know, again, beyond Baltimore, uh, maybe, you know, sometime early next year, you know, we, if, if you wouldn't mind coming back, it'd be great sure. to have you back. Always a pleasure. Seriously, man, I, I really appreciate you always coming back. And we have these incredible conversations. You're always a willing to give your point of view. And I thank you as always for coming on. You bet. Thanks a lot. Jer you too, man. We'll talk in a month. Jerry Conway, everybody. How about that? And, uh, you know, if everything goes right, we're going to also talk, uh, maybe have them on a, uh, a Streets of Marvel panel. We're, not, we're, we're working. We're still trying to put that together, depending on his availability. But at the very least, I can't wait for this conversation with Bendis. Thanks a lot for watching, everybody, tonight. Uh, stay safe, stay happy, and